Well, welcome, and here we go. We are um, into the the Tuesday edition of the Rit Race, uh, well into uh, week three now. And uh, as we watch the campaign unfold across the country, John Wright here. I'm Dave Trafford. Happy to welcome in uh, Bob Richardson is here. A long time, um, you know, I guess uh, uh, involved with the Liberal Party, the Liberal campaigns, the war rooms, etc. Bob, great of you to join us. Thanks for being here. Great to be here, Dave. So, you know, with your perspective, and uh, Amanda Galbraith was on with us last week, and she kind of has that same kind of perspective on from the inside looking out, outside looking in, war rooms, campaigns, etc. Just give me your, you know, 60 seconds on what you think this campaign looks like relative to all the other ones that you've worked on. Well, it's been a rough, bumpy start for the Liberals. Uh, I, I, I would be lying to say that they think that they've had a terrific run for the last two weeks. They've had a bit of a rough go. Uh, that being said, I, I do think it is still relatively early in this campaign. Um, I think a lot of Canadians haven't checked in, which is probably good for them. It doesn't necessarily mean that they can win because of that, but uh, I think that's probably helpful. And they seem to have bottomed out in the last three, four, four or five days and seem to be competitive again with the Conservatives. So I think if there was a big slide going on, it seemed to have been paused. Uh, we'll wait and see where, uh, where that heads from there. But uh, at this point, I think there's a lot of uh, sound, a lot of fury. Uh, I'm not sure there's a lot of fire yet. Well, but to be fair, this is the government that called the election. So, you know, out of all no of them, question. that they should have been ready for this. And I could, would think that the advice going in would have been to been far better prepared or appear to be prepared with, you know, a, a, some kind of ballot question framing as opposed to looking in the rearview mirror. No question. I thought their ballot framing on day one was weak. And quite frankly, so far, their principal opponent has been themselves. Uh, they've stepped on their message three or four different times. Uh, they've had, you know, the tour, they were kind of rerunning their 2019 and uh, 2015 tours in 2021. When you've been in government for six years, it's a different kettle of fish. And I think they're finding that out on the road. I think they corrected it, as we could see this week. And uh, their tour seems better, certainly in Granby and Canada today and in other places. So I think uh, uh, in uh, in Nunavut uh, yesterday, too, as well. So I think all three of those days were good uh, or events were good. But uh, they need to score a lot more good events if they're going to get back into this in a major way and uh, and uh, and form another government. So John's going to I want John to weigh in here on some of the the uh, ideas, the evolving attitudes that we're hearing and seeing and some of the polling numbers that popped up. And there's been a few in the last couple of days. But we left off yesterday in yesterday's episode. And, you know, John suggesting that in the absence of an obvious ballot question, that others are being developed. Afghanistan is a ballot question. John yesterday suggesting that the prime minister himself has become a ballot question here. Well, I think Trudeau's always been a ballot question. He was a ballot question in 2015. He was a ballot question in 2019. And there's no question he's a ballot uh, question this time. His job, if he's smart, is to frame it and say, there are two people who could be prime minister, me or Aaron O'Toole. I stand for this on health care, this on housing, this on seniors, this on the environment, this on gun control, the other guys over here, you guys pick who you want. If he does that in a clear, convincing way, I think, in the balance of the campaign, he has a good chance of still being the prime minister of the country. But they have to develop a better narrative than they have uh, to this point. It's been sort of a series of government announcements, if I can call it that. They need to be better knitted together. There needs to be a more cohesive uh, uh a ballot question and a more uh, cohesive narrative. If they can do that, I think they stand a good chance of being reelected. But John, even to the point you and we're making earlier in in the series, is that uh, affordability was up there at the top of the list. It took a while for the Liberal campaign to catch up with that, but uh, you know, even today, Mr. Singh is out there ringing that bell. Yeah, he is, and he's talking about taxes, and you know, it's all pocketbook and money stuff. I, you know, I. I reached a point today, probably about midday, when I saw the polls that have been released today, and there's still a couple more to come, where Bob's right. I mean, the slide has 
seems to have stopped. I mean, we're back to kind of where we were at the beginning of the campaign, but a little more support for the the conservatives. So not much more. Yeah. It's it's it, it's there. But I started to think about it because Dave Agar, who used to be at CFRB News Talk Ten Ten put out a, an interesting tweet, and he said that he'd got in the mail his ballot from Elections Canada, and then rather than having the slate to actually tick off the name and then put it in the envelope and send it back, it actually is a write-in ballot. Yeah. You have to actually do some work to go and find out who the candidate is and then to write the name in. And I don't know whether someone's going to be able to read the name. There could be a lot of spoiled ballots, but you have to do some work. And so, you know, if they were talking about a lot of people you know, voting that way, that could be a problem. Number two was just getting the vote out. I mean, we're, we're seeing kind of an artificial skating rink here, aren't we? I mean, we're, we're, again, we're polling and we're talking about people and their attitudes as if they were voters to go to the polls. But the more I'm, I'm starting to see some of these things, the more I sort of think that, you know, if we have in the middle of, of September in Ontario, the rise of the Delta variant, uh, if we've got kids, you know, at school, uh, off school and at home, if we've got, you know, elderly people who feel that they don't want to go out and expose themselves to uh, a polling booth, even though it might be even in their own place. I mean, there's a number of dynamics at play here in getting the vote out uh, for each party that we might need not even know in certain writings, given that people are putting in their ballots by mail. It could be counted over a couple of days. You know, like we're used to seeing at least... You know, those cliffhangers at two o'clock in the morning, you know, the CBC or CTV or Global declaring at least somebody. We may not see that. So I'm I'm curious, Bob, what I mean, this is unlike any other campaign, granted that. But getting the vote out is is going to be very interesting this time. Can Just to leave it with this. You and I would have ordered buses to go and get those people and take them to the polling booths and bring them back. I don't think you're going to do that this time. It's going to be a whole different ballgame. Yeah, it is. And it's interesting. Um, I am told that there are only about 250 to 300,000 Canadians have requested um, um, b- ballots at this point, mail-in ballots, of which they've only received 10 percent back. So that's around 25,000, 25 to 30,000. They were expecting between two and three million. So I'm not sure Canadians are exercising that quite in the way that Americans have. So that will be an interesting part of the dynamic. So far, from the looks of things and having chatted to some campaigns, people are are planning to vote in the advance polls or people are planning to vote on Election Day. So it looks pretty traditional to date. I'm not sure there's going to be as much uptake on early voting as there should be. There is one voting disgrace that should not be going on, uh, and Elections Canada should fix that, is no polling stations on university and college campuses. I think that is completely unacceptable. There is no reason why in this day and age we couldn't have uh, a polling stations on university and college campuses. They're saying, well, we couldn't get enough workers. Last time I checked, I believe we have 60,000 public service Servants coast to coast to coast. I'm sure we can find some people to run polling stations uh, at university and college campuses. So we're going to have, I think, a make, we're making it diff- difficult for younger uh, voters. Uh, voters are not uh, taking up the mail-in uh, option, at least to this point. So I think it's going to be fairly traditional. Uh, but again, uh, I could be wrong, but so far that seems to be where it's headed. Yeah, and I don't want to take up a lot of time on this, but to your point, those young people have tended to be more of the liberal cohort who have voted. You know, they they, they kind of helped in 2015 sweep uh, Justin Trudeau in. So, you know what, it, to your advantage or to the liberal advantage of having those booths there, you know, you, you would then get a lot more votes from that crowd. But if they're not there, the question is, do they actually show up and and vote at the poll? So I'm, you know, again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but this is a complication that I would think that if you're sitting like you have in a campaign, you've got a crew of people trying to figure this out, hopefully a while ago, but trying to figure out the tactical element to get those people out. 
Well, given what we've seen on the tour and the comm so far, I'm not sure they figured it out a few months ago. I think this <laughs> might be a little on the fly. <laughs> well, but again, you know, to your point, though, both of you, I mean, you would have thought that there would have been a basic checklist. You know, here's how we did it before. We're not doing it like that because of these five reasons, COVID being one and all the issues around it. So, you know, are they going to be able, the Liberals are going to be able to get out of their own way soon enough to make a difference? I mean, I realize that they've, that they've kind of recovered their footing to some degree in the last couple of days, Bob. But they've got ground to make up. And John's been pointing out over the last week or so, it's not that the Tories or the NDP are surging ahead with huge support. It's that the, the Liberal Party, the boss, it's going in, the re- in reverse. Well... I would say this. The Liberals have good bones. Uh, They've got some uh, good bones, if I could put it this way. They've got a strong ground game, probably the best ground game in the country uh, from coast to coast. They have got excellent candidates and they put a premium on candidates, much more so than other uh, other parties have. For instance, here in 416-905-55 ridings. Name me the conservative star candidate, the three or four big names that they've brought in. It's a big donut, which which surprises me. In a seat like Markham Unionville, they're running a 21 or 22 year old. And that was the seat they held during the Harper government. Could they take all those seats on a wave? Yes, they could. But barring a wave, you know, uh, that's when you need the local president of the Chamber of Commerce or councillor or mayor. And they haven't seemed to have done that sort of homework. The Liberals have coast to coast in 2015, in 2019, and in this time. So that's good. I think they've got some good, clear policies that they can run on and, and differentiate themselves from their uh, from their uh, opposition. And they've got a pretty decent record on the pandemic. Not perfect. So so if you can manage to kind of knit all that together, you do have a reasonable story to tell. I think they are weak on the why are we doing this? And there needs to be, I think, part, here's why we need to do it, and part mea culpa on that one. But So I think there's a possibility for them to be able to put it together. But uh, And I think they seem to be headed in that direction, which is good. But they got a lot of work to do. Does Afghanistan play prominently in the last three weeks of this campaign? Uh, I believe no. Uh, I believe it has at the beginning of the campaign. Uh, I, I think... It's tough to have sustained media in the last three weeks on this if it's not being as broadly covered. And I think that there was a huge personal element in the front end uh, of it that I I personally found compelling. I sit on the board of War Child Canada. We are trying to get people out. I sit on the board of Canada Soccer. We are trying to get the Afghan women's soccer team out. So I think like a lot of people, you were focused on the issue. Those sort of it's not going on anymore. Uh, so I think trying to sustain that um, as as a huge issue. And also, I think there are two camps on that issue. There are some that are mad exclusively at the present government and think that they were slow getting people out. And then there are others that say, hang on here. This has been going on for 10 years. And by the way, we didn't exact we weren't exactly the only guys caught with our pants down here. There were 14 other countries and also uh, U.S. intelligence. So I'm not so sure it's as clear cut an issue as people think it is. You know, what's interesting, Bob, is that every time the liberals seem to get some footing, they're they're impacted by outside circumstances. And the one thing that hasn't happened yet but is expected to be serialized no doubt by some of the media is we got a book coming we had a book out by a former cabinet minister who was dumped from the government and i wonder whether or not you know it, it kind of eats up three or four days and it stomps on messages but we may have some revelations from jody wilson raybolt not not too long from now yeah i think she's preaching to the converted if you're listening to judy uh wilson raybolt you likely don't like trudeau already i'm not so sure how many uh people she can bring over at this point she is pathologically pathologically opposed to this prime minister and to this government i think the feeling is mutual by the way I'm not sure how many people she's going to uh, convince. Uh, I do expect a media blitz from particularly right wing media like the National Post and the Sun and the Rex Murphys of the world and others on this topic. But uh, but short of that, I, 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 I'd put a big discount on that one. I don't think people take her that seriously anymore. So let's just 
look ahead because the next big thing on the calendar will be the debates. And to what degree, considering we don't have a platform yet, and when it's, I hear, you know, soon come is sort of the, 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 the refrain from the liberals, uh, two things. Does it matter? I am told very shortly. Oh, that's what we, <laughs> thanks for that insight. <laughs> I think, I think it's, but I think it's a very thin one. It's basically, what do you want? And here's the money. <laughs> it might be. That's, that's kind of it right, right there. Down, down to the final check in the checkbook. But to what degree does that really matter? I mean, for us, Bob, we're in the weeds on this stuff. Do people really give a rat's rectum that there isn't a platform that's published out there? One. Two is, um, do they focus more on preparation for this debate? Because it's not one of the things that necessarily the prime minister can win, but he can lose ground. Uh, I think you're right. On, on First on the debate piece, uh, it's important. And prob- weirdly enough, uh, one of the most important debates is this week. It's the TVA debate in Quebec. Mm. Huge audience in Quebec. Mm. It'll be important. Uh, this is uh, how the Trudeau guys handle this will be important. Uh, the prime minister needs to be good and forceful. His problem is um, uh, Aaron O'Toole's French, and I'm I'm born in Quebec City and I speak French, is not bad. And in actual fact, uh, I kind of like it. So uh, Andrew Scheer basically didn't speak French and kind of got away with pretending to as Speaker of the House of Commons with a few lines here and there. And that got showed up in the TVA debate and that put it put an end to his campaign. So I don't think the Liberals are going to get that sort of a bonus that they got last time. So I think it'll be important for the Prime Minister to do a really good job in the TVA debate and then in in the subsequent two uh, debates too as well. Uh, In terms of the platform, I don't think most Canadians give a rat's ass about the platform, to be honest. But it does feed into the narrative that they seem to be unprepared for the election that they Mm -hmm. called. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a fair criticism. I don't want to get esoteric about Quebec, but since you're there, from there, and you you understand the politics there, you and I and Dave have seen the Mulroney campaigns of 84 and 88. We saw, you know, the the nationalists go over uh, to support the conservatives. If you're looking at Quebec right now, um, what do you see in terms of the bloc versus the conservative and liberal vote? Does it does it move in a particular direction? I, I think it's pretty locked in, but uh, I could be wrong on this. I think the bloc is pretty much good for almost 30 seats or thereabouts. There's two Quebecs. There's the island of Montreal and West Quebec, and then there is kind of the rest of Quebec. The liberals do well on the island of Montreal and West Quebec the block pretty much everywhere else. The conservatives do do well in some of the rural uh, agricultural seats in and around Quebec City. Um, I think uh, Aaron O'Toole's job is to try to hold his 10 seats. I think he's had three, two or three or four uh, people retired. So he's got to try to hold and, and win uh, and maybe try to win a couple more. Uh, the Liberals have, if everything went right for them, could pick up six or eight seats from the Bloc. The Bloc's ability to, uh, to pick up some more seats, I think, is limited this time around. Um, so I think Quebec is going to come out in the wash a bit where we see it today. You know, the one thing that we haven't, the one party we haven't talked about at all is the NDP. And yeah. maybe that's just because we take them for granted or they're not on the, you know, the screen. But I'd be interested in getting your perspective on, you know, the liberals and the NDP fighting for that left vote and whether or not, you know, how, how the liberals are going to play that. Well, even despite Mr. Trudeau's troubles in the last two weeks, if you look at it, he's at best in the low 20s, uh, high teens, low 20s. 20s, depending on who you're looking at. Uh, He's competitive in three or four seats in Atlantic Canada. He's uh, competitive in precisely two seats in Quebec. In 416-905, 55 seats. I am going to be hugely generous and say he is competitive in five. I personally believe it's two, uh, so on and so forth. I don't think this is a serious campaign. And, And I say this with some respect. I like him. He seems like a nice guy. I don't think this has been a serious leader in that Ed Broadbent, Jack Layton, and Tom O'Care did the work 
recruiting candidates, putting the organization in place, doing kind of the gut work that you got to do in politics to get to a point where you can take advantage of stuff. This guy's been doing TikTok videos, and he hasn't he hasn't been doing the the sort of scut work that's required in politics. And I think it started to show. So let's look down the road. I mean, we started this conversation about talking about the launch of the campaign. The purpose, presumably, of the campaign was to win the Liberals a majority because that's what the Prime Minister said he needed to run effectively, run the country effectively. Uh, at that number, where did the Liberals would have to pick up something like 15 seats based on the way things were when it dissolved. The way you're talking and what I'm hearing from John and his numbers, uh, holding on to what you got might just be the best that they can hope for. <laughs> uh, you, you know, two months before this call, I thought a majority was very difficult to get. If you take a look at the Liberal vote, it's fairly maxed in the Atlantic, fairly maxed in Quebec, fairly maxed in Ontario, could pick up a few seats across the urban parts of the prairies, maybe a few in B.C. It, it's very tough, and a working majority isn't 15. A working majority is 25. So, you know, to get to get there, I thought this was a real stretch. I still think it's a stretch. I think it's highly unlikely now. So I think a little bit like uh, Mr. Davis in, uh, in uh, 1977 in Ontario, he got a minority in 75, went in 77. The Liberals had a new leader, and he thought he could kind of wipe the mat with them. That didn't quite work out. I think somebody's going to have to uh, swallow hard, apologize, and get down to work after this if he's lucky enough to come back and form a government. And for those of us that saw Mr. Davis, I mean, the the phrase, all in the fullness of time, uh, rings a bell. But I'm interested in one thing, Bob, because if there is a minority, um, and let's say it's a conservative opportunity minority, where does Jagmeet Singh go? I mean, he's already signaled that he might work with uh, Aaron O'Toole. Does he get courted by both sides, and do we naturally expect him to side with the Liberals, or do you think there's a potential there for some kind of uh, relationship? Well, 86% of NDP voters would expect him uh, to to a work to form a government with the Liberal Party. Uh, you know, it's one thing, and I, I understand what he's doing from a bravado expe- uh, perspective and also saying, hey, you know, I'm not – why do I need to show all my cards at this point? I'll wait until the election's over. I get that, but uh, I, I think he would have cohesion problems. I think it would be difficult for a number of new Democrats to swallow backing the conservatives on a whole variety of different issues. It kills child care. Uh, it, it kills a variety of different things. This is the crowd that 62 of them voted for conversion therapy. Let's. This is the crowd that wants semi-automatic uh, weapons. Let's just keep going through the list. Uh, if you're a New Democrat NDP, if you're Brian Massey from Windsor, I don't think you want to go home and say, hey, we're going to back this guy and here's the things that his party agrees with. I think they'd have a tough time doing it. But isn't the message that the same, whether it's the Tories or the Liberals, is that the the NDP are positioning themselves as the one who are forcing the government to adopt what is in their agenda to be able to say, you know, if we're going to get, you're going to get my support, you're going to have to deal with this on child care or whatever it might be. So he, he's not just going to throw it open and say, there it is. Uh, he, he would have some chips on the table to say, you know, if and when this is what I require. Yeah, I think he'll he'll do something like that. He may even go for an accord like we saw between the NDP uh, and the Liberals in 1985 in Ontario, or it could be an accord without being in government saying we've agreed to the following things for the next number of years uh, and they have to implement them. So it's not necessarily just by issue by issue. So he can then go back and say, look at all the stuff I secured for you. Mm -hmm. I think he's got a couple of options there, and he'll be more in the driver's seat. Well, I mean, to your point as to, you know, the, the, the quality of the leadership there is, is one thing. I mean, being the entertainer and being the guy who's very likable is one thing, but to be able to negotiate and be that politically savvy on his own, I mean, that's one thing. Does he have the team around him to, to support him in that? He has some bright, uh, uh, very experienced staffers. Anne McGrath comes to mind, who's been around for a long period of time. Very capable new Democrat. Uh, he's got some good people in his caucus. 
uh, too, as well, who could, who could certainly help out. He doesn't have that sort of experience, I don't think, either from the provincial legislature or in the last couple of years. Well, well, let's leave it there. Bob, it was great of you to join us. It's great to have your uh, your insights. And if you don't mind, we might bug you between now and the uh, the 20th of uh, September and uh, see how things are either roaring ahead for the Liberals or <laughs> trying to find a place to hide. Either way. It was well, great of you I to would join say us. buckle up. <laughs> It'll be fun. <laughs> we'll do that. Bob Richardson joining us today on The Rit Race. I'm Dave Trafford. He's John Wright. The Rit Race is an eye contact podcast.